Okay, so welcome back. And here we are in the course on environmental bioethics within the Master of Science in Bioethics at St. Thomas University. And this is uh, the first lecture of this course, which is entitled Human Population and Environmental Bioethics. I always would begin with uh, a little prayer. So let's go there now. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your divine love. We continue to pray for peace at the beginning of this new year of grace, peace in our hearts, and peace in our world. And this we ask in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay, so this course then is the complementary of the human life courses in bioethics, right? Because we covered the beginning of human life, the end of human life, healthcare, which is in between the beginning and the end, all right? And the bioethical issues that arise there, which were many, as we see, and increasing bioethical issues because they're driven mostly by technology, right? The more technology advances, the more sophisticated things get, the more power we have, and what used to be science fiction a few years ago now becomes a reality. But the big biological question, of course, is always the same, which is uh, not we can do it, we can do it technologically, but should we do it? May we do it, right? And that's what we were talking about a little bit earlier, that the prevailing ethics in society is a utilitarian ethics, utilitarian bioethics. In other words, if it can be done, do it as long as it's legal. That's utilitarian. Don't worry about the means. But in principle bioethics, which is the alternative, and it's the Catholic bioethics, we have to justify the means also. <laughs> the means also have to be justified, not just the end. And so in the early discussion of end of life, we're looking at a uh, hemlock of society, which eventually transitioned to be compassion and choices. But that's a euphemism to uh, gloss over the reality that it's a suicide because it's PAS, physician assisted suicide. The patient is killing herself or himself, but with the assistance of the physician. What's the assistance of the physician? The prescription of the hemlock. In other words, the prescription of the two drugs that will cause a heart attack, right? And so PAS, physician assisted suicide, but it's a suicide. It's a killing of self and we don't have a right to kill ourselves. Mm -hmm. The alternative is manage the pain, which could involve increasing dosage of uh, morphine, but the pain is being managed. We know that long-term, that's gonna take a toll on the brain for sure. <clears throat> but the idea is that the patient is dying imminently, all right? It's already like in hospice or terminal ill. So what will kill the patient is the terminal illness, not the morphine that is being increased gradually. Yeah. So it comes down to the dosage, the proper dosage to manage the pain at this time, not the overdosage to kill the patient for compassion, <laughs> put them out of our misery. <laughs> and, then, and that's what's going on there. Uh, so the alternative to that is really the principle that life is sacred and we don't have a right to take the life of a human being, but we have a right to allow people to die. And so we manage their pain and suffering to the best medicine that we have today. But ultimately, if it's a terminal illness, then that illness will take the patient's life. Right? The arguments start becoming subtle, but unless we reason through them, then we're going to get lost. And that's why philosophy is foundation. It's foundation. Okay, so then, uh, also this is the complement to the human life issues, which is the environmental issues. But the environmental issues also have a human component and that's why this course is actually, it's not just environmental bioethics, it's human population and environmental bioethics. Very hot topic and that's why we have to navigate, like it says we have to cut between joint and marrow. You know, we can't just um, put on blinders and say, oh no, keep uh, deforesting 
the world and chop it down and let's build condominiums all over the place. Or the alternative is drop everything, uh, don't do any more damage, and let's go back and live in the jungle like primitive people. <laughs> exactly, exactly, right? Like some people, are, some utilitarians are proposing that, uh, particularly in the developing world, we used to call those third world countries, <laughs> developing world, uh, just blanket contraception so that they don't reproduce anymore. And that's actually eugenic. You know who had that mentality here in the US? Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood. Well, she, wanted to... she had a she sent a letter to the uh Gamble brothers from Procter and Gamble, right? We're talking almost a century ago. She sent a letter to the Gamble brothers when she was trying to develop uh the contraceptive. She was a nurse, but she didn't have the skills, the biochemical skills that were necessary, and the clinical trials and all that. That was done by Pinkers and Rock, John Rock, remember? We covered that way back. Anyway, she sends a letter to the Gamble brothers to solicit some money, funding, to pay Pinkers and Rock for doing the trials. And in the letter, in part of the letter, she puts, we don't want it to get out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. In her writing to the Gamble brothers, and you, you put those words in and it comes up online, <laughs> it's there. So she was a eugenicist in the 1930s, which was a spillover from Nazi Germany, the original eugenicists in this thing, in last century now, but in our own time. And that had spilled over into the US in the 30s and 40s. There was an active eugenics movement in the United States in the 30s and the 40s and so forth. I get what if someone is putting in the news and I'm going to sit right saying his work, no, to abortion, the abortion plans are like, oh, they got it right. Exactly. They got it right. Yes. And to this day, many of the abortion clinics are in poor neighborhoods. Uh, African Americans or Hispanics or Asians in the West Coast. And so uh, it, it's horrible. It's horrible. Just mm -hmm. sick. But it's there and it's documented. Anyway, thanks be to God for Dobbs last year, Supreme Court reversal of Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade. Uh, it took 49 years, almost half a century. But uh, last year, that's the reversal. So it goes back to the states and so on and so forth as we were before 73. So now we have a fighting, fighting chance because each state can work it out. All right. <laughs> And that's why, but uh, back to the title itself, it's um, informative in this sense, the environment by itself. Let's say, uh, <coughs> excuse me, scientists have classified approximately 2 million species on earth today from animals, plants, bacteria, fungi, and all the living creatures, uh, organisms, about 2 million different species, okay? We're one of those 2 million species. It's estimated that's about five to 10% of the species on earth. So it can be anywhere between 10 to 20 million species. Where are the others? The others are mostly microscopic, single cell at the bottom of the ocean. And that's why we haven't discovered them, but it's, a, it's an estimate. <coughs> Excuse me. The raspiness is coming back. All right, so if we hypothetically, with a mental exercise, take out, it's a mental experiment, take out the human population of the world, all right? That means eight, eight billion people. <laughs> uh, all of a sudden just think about hypothetically, what do we have left? Well, just our artifacts, the buildings and the construction and the cars and everything else that we left behind, all right? All of a sudden we disappear, whatever we did, we left behind. Fast forward that, or just forward it over time, Without humans, what's going to happen to the artifacts on Earth? They're going to get covered by vegetation. They're going to demolish by weathering <laughs> and fall apart by hurricanes and storms and earthquakes. And so eventually, whatever we have built will be taken over by nature. And nature will continue to grow and develop and so forth. And they said, one species lost, who cares? We're actually better off <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> if we think like the rest of nature, right? 
because that puts them back into their normal competition that they've been doing for millions of years, which we call evolution and natural selection. But this one species has an impact. So uh, <clears throat> the rest of nature can certainly do without us or any one other species. It just gets replaced. And that's what we call speciations. We have, in fact, there is an actual extinction rate going on. There's a background extinction rate in evolution, right? And then we have this whole study. Sorry? Is that number old study? That extin extinction yeah. rate? Yeah, it's a background extinction rate, just right. like it's, it's what we call a dynamic system, just like our bodies are making new cells all the time, right? Through mitosis, right. but old cells are dying. Right. Mm -hmm. Are being replaced. Every 24 hours, we lose millions of RBCs. If they're not replaced, we become anemic and we die. So right. the spleen digests all RBCs. And the bone marrow makes new RBCs, and it's a dynamic state. It's like a tank of water. You have water flowing in, and you have water flowing out. But the tank remains at a particular level, right? It's the flow. Mm -hmm. Anyway, with regards to species, that's the way it is. You know, some species die out. That's extinction. Because when a species doubts out, it's forever. It will never come back as that species again. Because the exact environmental conditions will never be replicated over a long period of time, exactly the same. Because in the meantime, other things have happened. <laughs> and so it's a very interesting dynamic uh, state so that we can only move forward in time and place and evolution and selection and speciation, all right? But we happen to be present here and now. We, the, the Homo sapiens species, we did the background of the origin of the species, when we look at other hominines, remember Homo erectus, Homo habilis, Homo neanderthalis, etc. <clears throat> so there are other genus Homo that existed before us. The fossil record is there. We can't deny the bone that's in front of us, right? Uh, but they're extinct now. So we're the only species of that genus that is living today, biologically speaking. Which, which was the element in the periodic table again that they measure when they're measuring like an artifacts? Like carbon. Carbon. Yes, because okay. part of the standard carbon is carbon 12, which means that it has six protons and six neutrons. Right. So it makes it 12. But there's carbon 13 and carbon 14, which are radioactive. In other words, it has two more carbon 14 right. specifically has two more neutrons. Mm -hmm. But those two neutrons, because they're in excess, it's not balanced, you know, right. so then they tend to fall off. And the falling off is the decay. And so initially carbon-14 is radioactive, somewhat radioactive. And when they, when one of those neutrons falls off, then it becomes carbon-13. It loses radioactivity. That can be measured with a Geiger counter. And it takes X number of years to lose that one neutron. And then in the same amount of time, it loses the other neutron and it's by you know, it's like a building going floor by floor. It's in quanta, in the specific Every quantities. A neutron until it becomes carbon-12, and that's more stable. And that's the decay rate, the decay, which is a parabolic thing. It's a rate of decay. Each element has a specific rate of decay. From seconds, stuff that is super radioactive, that they lose their neutrons right away, to the stable state. Or the opposite is to millions of years or even four billion years like uranium, which is the oldest element on earth. Mm -hmm. And we can measure uh, with the decay of uranium, we can measure not life, but the origin of the planet going back four and a half billion years, which is what we're gonna get into today. Mm -hmm. So what we have basically is uh, <clears throat> the rest of nature can do without us. Uh, but we cannot do without the rest of nature steps, okay? Because uh, at least up until now, we still need to eat and breathe, et cetera, and that is all coming from nature. So it behooves us, even for selfish reasons, to take care of nature, because in the destruction of nature, we end up destroying ourselves too, right? So it's gotta be a balance. And like I say, we have to live somewhere, and wherever I live, that vegetation is gone. You know, unless I'm going to live in the jungle, <laughs> up a tree or something. In the Amazon. Yes. <laughs> and I'm not going to last too long in Amazon, maybe 24 hours or less before something comes around, a puma or something eats me up. Because <laughs> yep. I don't have the equipment to fight against the puma. So 
uh, we we need to employ technology we used to use it, but we try to use it as wisely as possible and try to minimize our footprint and being eco-friendly and all this kind of right. stuff. All right. So it, it requires more creativity. We cannot continue in large swaths of terrain just to blanket out all the vegetation there and do crops, for example. You know, because in fact, even crops, we grow. It's estimated that we grow about four times more food that is necessary to feed eight billion people. Four times with it with the quaternary agriculture that we have today. In other words, agriculture has become so efficient mm -hmm. with the combines that go through the corn and pick out and one one part of the combine on, on the front of the machine is the corn on the cob that's being picked by the machine. And on the back of the thing comes out practically canned, all the corn grains by itself in bags ready to be processed in the factory. You know, so become very efficient at agriculture. So we actually produce four times more food that is needed. Yeah, there's so many people starving. In exactly. World. This is the irony of it. Half of that, half of that production, which is stored because it doesn't go directly from the farm to my plate, you, right? When you're saying we produce four times as much, you're saying it, the world produces. Yes, the world. Okay. okay. Like the Ukraine, for example, take Ukraine is one of 200 countries in the world, all right? And it's not one of the largest countries either. It's a medium sized country. It's certainly much more than the US. Right. And much, much smaller than Russia, which covers 12 time zones, all of Siberia, it goes half around the world, Russia. So territorially, Russia doesn't need the Ukraine. Right. But Ukraine used to produce, before uh, the, the invasion, used to produce about half of the wheat for the whole world. Wheat. Of wheat. Wow. Bread. Imagine. So it's a grain factory. It was huge. Very fertile ground best weather possible, et cetera, et cetera. And they have perfected the agriculture to be so efficient that it produced practically half of the wheat for the whole world. And that's why there was a crisis in food and there's a crisis in everything when that invasion happened, okay? So uh, there are all kinds of consequences uh, that are involved. <clears throat> but uh, my point earlier was that uh, we have become also the four times, what do we do with, how come there's people starving in the world? Because about half, I read in another missionary uh, journal that about half of the people of the world go to bed hungry every day. At night, four billion people are hungry, all right? Don't say what happens, what did this, what's the disconnect? Well, this is part of the disconnect. About half of that, of that production of food is lost to fungi, bacteria, rodents, rots in granaries and containers. We're producing excess. We're producing in excess because we're taking into account the loss we're gonna have. Yes, some. so half of that is lost to critters. <laughs> we're right. feeding the rodents of the world and fungi right. and everything else, it goes bad, okay? But that still leaves twice as much food. And why are people starving? Because of corruption. Because the other food that is available doesn't get to the people who need it. And you go to poor countries of the world, in the marketplace, you see these big bags of wheat mm -hmm. that are all stamped with United Nations donation, free for the people and all that. You open it up with a knife and they sell you that rice. And those were donations. And that's the bag that eventually worked out to the market because the people in power have their own bags, their own years and years of storage in their own mansions somewhere in there. Right. Okay. And that is corruption. There's no two ways about it. It's corruption. <clears throat> okay, Jose, these are the things and that's why we have to deal with, we have to engage the people and the leaders of the world. Because if the leaders are corrupt, what can you expect from the, oh, the rest? It all goes right? downhill. It does. Okay, so we're going to look at how to be eco-friendly as best as possible. And yes, the whole issue of um, fossil fuels is uh, contributing when they're burned. When we burn, it's not the fossil fuel itself, but it's the burning of the fossil fuel that increases the CO2, and it's a major greenhouse gas. In other words, it heats up the atmosphere. Don't worry about too much of the detail because we'll get into it through the seven 
uh, modules. Okay, I'm just giving you an overall today, an overview. So <clears throat> you can see that the first three modules talk about the, the earth itself, the three compositions of the earth, the three spheres, the geosphere, the atmosphere, and the hydrosphere. Think that would be under Earth geophysics. No, this is just a PowerPoint that I sent you, the first slide. Right. No, but I was I was looking. Um, oh yeah, well. In the word document. Oh, the word. Yes, let's see. Right. That's where I was going to see the little the little ball. Yeah, Earth geophysics is what we're going to cover today, but we're going to a little little uh, background of how the Earth came to be, <laughs> mm -hmm. and then we'll go from there into the rest of it. So we're really at the very beginning here. No, well, uh, no, this, that would just, the earth geophysics is just the geosphere here. That's the first module that we're going to cover today. Okay. I'm just taking a long time of the introduction. <laughs> this is an overview. This is still an overview of the whole course. Next uh, video, next lecture will be on the atmosphere. And the one after that will be the hydrosphere. Let's stop there for a moment and you think about it. Geosphere is the actual earth, material, physical, mostly solid, the solid earth, right? Talking about uh, mountains, uh, rocks, uh, the bottom of the ocean, et cetera. Okay, that's the geosphere. Uh, la madre tierra, the earth. The atmosphere is the gas component of the earth. The atmosphere, right? It's gas. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's the air in front of us and throughout the earth. About 10 to 20 miles up is the atmosphere and the composition of the atmosphere. That's where the CO2 is, for example. And then the hydrosphere, that should be obvious. The hydrosphere is the liquid component of the earth, which is basically the oceans, the rivers, the lakes. All right? And life inhabits these three spheres. So again, it's just a little overview. Cycles is going to involve looking at some, uh, the main cycles of the earth, like for example, the oxygen cycle, the CO2 cycle, the uh, water cycle, the nitrogen cycle, or some basic cycles that occur in nature to understand a little bit better what ecology is going to be about. Energy flow, we're going to look at how energy flows through the system. Again, the big picture of energy, what is the energy that comes into the earth? Exactly, some light, the light. And what's the energy that leaves the earth, leaves the earth as a system? Uh, so we say that the sun is it a luminous body or an opaque body. Luminous because it gives off light, photons specifically, right? right? Okay. Uh, are we luminous? We, the Earth, is the Earth luminous or opaque? Like the other planet, we're opaque. In other words, we don't glow, all right? But we do give off energy. What kind of energy do we give off? It's a radio, radial energy, radiation energy, which is a transformation from light. Okay. So it's like a... We get it and we give back. And, and it's radiation. transformed. It is a radiation. I'll give you a hint, for example. Uh, if we park the car outdoors on a sunny day, eventually what happens to the inside of the car? It gets it's hot. hot. Oh, heat. Heat. So it's an energy transformation. Right. And it's very physical. It's very real. We can measure it. The, the light that goes through the windows and hits the panels and hits inside the car is transformed. Part of it is reflected out, so we can see inside the car if it's not glared, you know, we can see inside the car because of the light that's bouncing off the inside. That's called reflection. But another part is transformed, literally transformed into heat. And heat radiates out. It, and it radiates radially. In other words, like a sphere, like a big sphere. So we give off heat into the universe and that heat dissipates and that's called entropy. And it's energy that is lost because it doesn't, it's not able to do any work. Light can be used for doing work when it's transformed into a chemical energy. Who does that transformation of light into a chemical energy, which is a chemical storage? 
is nature's equivalent of a battery. In battery, we have potential energy. Light is transformed into chemical energy by a process in nature that maintains life on Earth. What is that process? Again, it's so obvious we miss it. Nature is involved in it all the time. And nature you know, is. It comes to mind, I don't even know what's right. It's the complete opposite of the That's it. Oh, okay. That's it. That's it. Bingo. Bingo. That's bingo. Yeah. Because what does the what does the leaf do? It takes light, and transform it into a chemical, into right. a chemical right. bond of the glucose. So it's storing that energy. It stores it into what we call potential energy. You know, a battery has potential energy, but the battery is different from glucose in that in glucose, the uh, the energy is stored as chemical energy and the bond and the carbon bonds chemically, but in the battery is stored as electricity, which is another type of energy. So we can talk about light energy. We can talk about heat energy. We can talk about electrical energy. If I put my finger in there, you know, I'm not gonna get glucose out of there. I'm gonna get electrical shock, <laughs> electrical zap. And, and it's energy, I don't see it, but it lives, it's real. Well, it lives not in the biological sense, but it, it's real, you feel it. And that's why we have to be very careful with, with, with electricity because we don't see it, but it's there, it's very real. Okay, so uh, when we get to this, we're gonna look at those energy transformations and how in that process, life occurs, life occurs, okay? Biological life. And then we're gonna transition into the human population and do some dynamics of human population growth and growth curves. Remember the carrying capacity, what is the carrying capacity of the human population? We don't know. We know the carrying capacity of every other species because we can experiment and see, but how do we run an experiment with all human population? What is the carrying capacity of the earth for the human species? We have no clue. Plus we have something that other uh, animals and plants and bacteria and fungi don't have which is technology, you know, like agriculture. So we're gonna look at those dynamics and then finally we'll address the question of climate change. Is there climate change or not? And what percentage of the climate change is anthropogenic? In other words, caused by the human. And that's where perhaps we can make a difference on the ethics of it. Asike, we're gonna build up the case here. <laughs> And that's why this is master's levels and not just uh, at, the, at the bachelor level, okay? Well, vamos allá. So let's look at... Uh, yeah, yeah, uh -huh. that's right. Loyola on Bird Road, <laughs> on, on Coral Way near the youth center. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think uh, we shared this uh, one time. Uh, I start, That's where I started teaching in 1967 or 68. I, I was, no, sorry, no, 77 or 78. Because I graduated from FIU in 73 with biology and then I followed around for a while and eventually I started teaching. So about 70, no, about 75 or 76, I was teaching at Loyola. 1975. How much older are you? I'm born on 57. Yeah, I'm 71. So we're 71. about we're 15 years, 14 years. Yeah. Yeah, I just turned 71. So Loyola brought back a lot of memories. Benitez, uh, we talked about Mrs. Ventura. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> amazing. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yes, yes. <clears throat> you never heard of a professor, Alberto Martinez Ramos? Martin Ramos, he used to teach social sciences, history, humanities. Martin Ramos, back then he was young. He always had a black beard. Yeah, he had a black beard, always a black beard. We were all young at that time. He used to have a, a firebird. And so we go to the mutiny <laughs> on the bathroom. Remember the mutiny <laughs> in uh, Booker Grove? <laughs> anyway. Okay, it does it. Here we go with... I'm going to do a very quick uh, overview of the origin of the universe. So we'll start at the very beginning, like uh, the Sound of Music uh, little song. <laughs> and then we're going to look at the origin of the Earth within that. And then we'll get into geophysics. All right? Okay. So, universe. 
still, this is preamble of preamble of preamble. Mm -hmm. Components of our universe. <clears throat> the stuff that we see and the stuff that we don't see. In other words, the visible and the dark, we don't want to call it invisible because there's stuff there, but we can't really see it. Visible matter slash energy is only about 5% of the universe. If we had the whole universe in a, in a bottle or in a container, 5% right? of that container is what we call visible universe. In other words, the matter that surrounds us, this includes everything on Earth, everything in our solar system, including the inner planets, the outer planets of uh, Mars, Venus, uh, Saturn, Jupiter, well, we are the Sun. What you're saying. Yeah. We can see through. Well, that we can measure. We can right. measure. All right. This is with astronomy and cosmology right. up to date. Right. But the best astronomer, what well, the best astronomy and cosmology is telling us today. Okay. We go beyond our solar system. And there are other solar systems that are we're embedded in one of the galaxies called the Milky Way. And there are millions, trillions of galaxies that form the universe. That's coming up in the next slide. No, we are one of trillions of galaxies in the Milky Way. Yeah, the picture gets so big, Elizabeth, that the mind boggles. So let's find the Milky Way. Very. This is the Milky Way I've seen at night. This passage, well, this is something a little more illustrative. You can see, obviously, this is a photograph on a starry night, as we say. And these are just stars. Dots, these are actually not stars. I'll talk about it. And this is the Milky Way. It's called Milky Way because it was seen already thousands of years ago. It's even more dramatic. Okay. And it was seen thousands and thousands of years ago, uh, just with the naked eye on moonless nights without any artificial lights around, of course, that generate glare on the atmosphere. So you look up into one of these very dark nights and you see a streak of, let's call them stars that are clustered like this. And so it looks like a highway and it's whitish, so the Milky Way just human intuition of thousands of years ago. Years Remember? Yeah. Yep. So yes, it's coming back. Galaxy. So we're actually embedded in here. All right. We're embedded in here. <clears throat> and this Milky Way, if we were to back out of it at a distance, it would start looking more like something like this. <laughs> which is a regular galaxy, you know? So there's a little dot there. In other words, we are embedded and that's one galaxy, all right? Out of trillions of galaxies, because then we can, uh, <clears throat> let me see if I have a slide on that. We can subdivide, think of a, <clears throat> walking out on a moonless night and you look up at the sky and in general you see two kinds of dots you see little tiny dots and you see bigger dots mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. uh, even here you see little tiny dots and then there are right. these bigger dots right. okay and so in general if we can classify them as little dots and big dots and we say those are stars different types of stars the fact is that neither one are stars the little dots are actually galaxies. Now, a star, a sun is a star. Sun, star is, they're synonyms, right? Mm -hmm. Sun and star are synonyms. So our sun is our star. It's a luminous body. It's actually a ball of gas, of hydrogen gas that is burning. It's the fourth state of matter. What are the three stable states of matter that we have on Earth? States of matter. A lot of physics. Solid. Right. All different gas. Exactly. Right. The fourth state of matter, there's a fourth state, is not stable on Earth, but it does exist for a flash of time until it runs out of combustion, it runs out of fuel. A match, 
uh, a vela, a candle, a fire. Mm -hmm. The actual fire exists, it's real. If I touch it, I burn. Right. So it exists. What state is it? Is it solid? Put my finger, right? You ever done that trick right. of a flame? You can yeah. put your finger through the flame right. fast? Okay, so it's not solid. We're gonna stop the finger. It's not liquid, because I felt something. It's not even gas. It's plasma. It's the fourth state of matter. It's But it's unstable because as soon as the candle runs out of fuel, it stops, right? The sun, which is a star, is a ball of hydrogen gas that is inflamed. But because it's in a three-dimensional space, it's circular, it's spheric. Mm -hmm. So gas in space will form a ball. <laughs> Ignite it and you get a little tiny sun. <laughs> but that's only gonna last a few seconds. The sun has lasted about four and a half billion years. So remember a billion is a thousand million. So you put three more zeros, it's four to the nine, right? To the ninth power. So the sun has been around for, for, for about four and a half billion years. And so the planets, so that's our solar system. And it's estimated that the sun is about halfway through burning its fuel. So it's got another four and a half billion years to go, but it's not infinite. In about four and a half more billion years, the sun is turning off, <laughs> it's running out of fuel. Of course, before it does that, it's gonna go through some dramatic physical and chemical properties. First, it's going to inflame, it's going to expand, and then it's going to collapse, and then it's going to explode. <laughs> and that's the sequence of and what we call the death of a star. And that's gonna take a few million years also to do. So certainly, I plan to watch the show from above. <laughs> oh, <laughs> exactly. It's gonna be a glorious show, but this universe is not really infinite. It's got a time sequence, you know, and a time period. So <clears throat> the little dots are entire galaxies, which contain trillions of suns or trillions of stars. But why do they look like just one little dot, like if it were a single sun? Because it's so incredibly far away that all we can see is a little tiny speck of it. The same experiment, <clears throat> we need three people or even two people will suffice. You can be the observer and I'll be the backward walker. <laughs> Again, we're at night on a plain terrain, all right? Even a long parking lot would do. And I have two flashlights, which I turn on at each end of my hands here, all right? Mm -hmm. And so you're gonna be looking at me, but it's dark at night, so all you see is the flashlights. And you can definitely see two. I'm gonna start walking backwards. And those two flashlights are gonna, those two lights are going to start coming together <laughs> until I'm far enough that you only see one dot, but it's still the same distance. Again, it's the perspective, the vanishing point using light instead of rails, <laughs> okay? So these guys are so incredibly far away, these galaxies, that they look as a single little dot. Now, Let's get much closer. What about the big guys? It is like star dust. <laughs> yeah, right. Which is another thing, which is what's left after the explosion. The dust is is atoms that are floating through the universe. It's like glitter. Yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> now, the big dots are not suns either. In fact, planets. sorry, planets. exactly. And why, so why do we see if they're planets by definition, are they luminous or opaque? They're opaque? So why, you just turn on a planet? Oh, oh yes, 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 yes. What are we seeing of the planet? We're seeing a reflection of sun. The ref what do we see of the moon? Reflection. We see the sun's reflection on the moon. Turn off the sun, can't see the moon. It's right there, it's in the same place, but we can't see it. So. Those are opaque bodies that are reflecting the sunlight. Can you imagine? 
and those are the big gods, which are our planets, because we're not looking at exoplanets. Exoplanets are planets that don't belong in our solar system. We have eight planets, right? Four inner planets, four outer planets, and those are the ones that we see. So, um, to remind me again, las personas que se dedican like to study like the solar system, the universe. Astronomy now. is for asters, and cosmology is for the cosmos. For the uh, cosmos is another word for the universe. But astronomy is more the asters, what is the bodies. Well, yeah. yeah. They're they're putting rockets in there's they're they're planning to build a colony, a human colony on Mars. That's a real project. And a colony on the moon. In fact, it was just delayed. Last week was delayed because they were sending, it's been decades. You remember Neil Armstrong? <laughs> the footprint the one exactly uh that was in the 60s that was all yeah yeah <laughs> there'll always be conspiracy you know there's always the doubters and the denials and all that but there's there's yeah, plenty of proof case, um, I saw documentary oh yes really oh, i should take a look because always since he was a little kid had fascination with planes and yes Good, I'm glad. Yeah, he was. Uh, well, talk about like being singled out. I mean, I guess we all are. But some yeah, people, well, look at Einstein. Some people are very singled out. Yeah, certain yeah, the yeah. They have certain. Th there's no question that some people have certain talents for things, you know. But many times we don't discover what our talents are. Like Einstein didn't talk until he was about I don't know, maybe four or five years old. But then when he started talking, he just talked full sentences in perfect grammar. He didn't do any Google gaga gaga. Ga. <laughs> yeah. So it's like that. He was just sitting there absorbing it all until he could say something that was actually reasonable. <laughs> anyway, uh, so you can see really what we see. That's why Plato was going, no, no, this is all perceived, this is all deceptive. We don't really have access to the real. We look at this blue, we look at the moon at night and someone must have turned on a bulb there because I'm looking at the moon as if it were luminous, but it's not luminous, it's opaque. <laughs> if I don't understand the physics of reflective light from the sun, then I'm not gonna understand why I can actually see the moon when it's an opaque body, all right? Okay, so back here then in the meantime, <clears throat> The visible matter slash energy, because then there's a conversion, matter and energy are equivalent in that the famous formula of E equal MC square of Einstein, the capital E is for, I'm just gonna put it here, or maybe this makes more sense. I'm going to parentheses E equals MC. Then the carrot means, oops, you know, that carrot means uh, exponent, right? This little thing is called a carrot. Is it? That's called a carrot. The symbol is called a carrot, like a carrot diamond. <clears throat> and then what I, the number after the carrot is an exponent. Mm -hmm. All right? So it's uh, square. If I put a three here, then it will be cubed and so forth. E, capital E stands for energy. Small m stands for mass, which we know it as weight. But the mass, in other words, on the scale, when I step on the scale, what I'm reading is my mass, not my weight. Because the weight is mass times gravity, the gravitational pull. In space, I have the same mass but I have a different weight. I am right. weightless because there's no gravity right. or there's less gravity. Right. So weight, uh, takes into, weight takes into account gravity. Yes, exactly. And weight, by the way, this funny stuff here, uh, uh, gravity at the surface of the earth, that's what Newton measured, is 9.8 meters per second square. It's a pull, it's an acceleration. Okay, gravity is an acceleration toward the center. And it's just a number that I remember from high school, 9.8. Uh, we can round it up to 10 mm -hmm. meters per second square. In other words, that's the pull. 
10 meters per second square. So in, in, in a second square, that pool would move the object 10 meters. It's a pretty substantial pool, and it's what's keeping us on Earth instead of just floating out. <laughs> so it's a good thing. But if you think about it, the 10, right? 10 meters per second square, that's G, that's gravity. So my weight, W, would be mass times gravity, M times G. Our mass, let's say I, I weighed myself the other day, 150 pounds, times G is how much? Times 10. Right. So my real weight is not 150, it's 1,500. <laughs> 10 times more well. than the mass. So we better stick with the mass right. and forget about the weight. <laughs> And the, and the units, just to finish that discourse, the units of that, mass times gravity, right? The units are Newtons, which is a capital N. Newton in honor of Newton, because really when we break it down, what are the units? The units are grams per meter per second square, which is an awkward, you know, unit. <laughs> And so that whole unit is called Newtons. And that unit is very practical. It's used in astronomy all the time. So they measure how many Newtons will this rocket weigh on Earth? And then when it goes on to space and so forth. Very important. Absolutely. Because those Newtons will change. The mass will not change, but the Newtons will change according to the different gravitational fields where that rocket is moving from and landing on another object, on another planet or moon, etc. Isn't it interesting? I mean, I think it's simple, but I'm kind of simple. It is. Very abstract thing you can do. It is. And creative. That part of my brain is like well, activated like that. The math part, this fellow is doing the math part. Right. What the human should do is the creative part. Where do we want to send the rocket and why there? Right. And then we crunch in the numbers. Right. Want to watch a fun movie? The Martian. The Martian is a great movie. So we can talk more about The Martian, but it's not about little green men from Mars. Okay. It's about the moon colony. It's science fiction because it's a future, futuristic movie, but it's a recent future and it's very realistic. It's very possible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this, yeah. Great guy. Yeah. He's a. Uh, yeah, no. Matt, Matt, uh, Matt, Matt, is it Mark Wahlberg? Mark is the character. He's the character. Yes, and uh, yes, Matt Damon, you know Damon? Matt Damon. Matt Damon. Matt Damon. Matt Damon, something Matt like that. Damon. Yes, yes. I know I'm definitely, I've seen like, the poster. The, the yeah, the video, the, the clip. <clears throat> take a look, take a look, The Martian. I think you'll enjoy it. Um, anyway, he gets left behind. That's at the very beginning of the moon because he's presumed dead. Uh, they have to scrub the mission. And then the whole movie is uh, how to see if they can possibly rescue him. So <clears throat> the visible matter energy, and why do I mention, inner, oh, sorry. Okay, so let's go back. Uh, mass, M is mass. C, little c, it just stands for constant. And what is the universal constant? The universal constant is the fastest thing in the universe. The first sound. light, not I sound. Which yeah. a, an easy way to remember is this, that sound needs a medium. If there was a vacuum between us, then you, you couldn't hear what I'm saying because there's no medium, all right? But light doesn't require medium. Light travels through space and through a vacuum. We can see light through vacuum, otherwise we couldn't see the sun because there's vacuum <laughs> in between us, all right? Uh, and so C is the universal constant, which is the speed of light, which is 300,000 kilometers per second. Per second, okay? Don't say. And so we're going to do another mental experiment. Einstein was a theoretical physicist. He never went into a lab as such. He all did his mental experiments. Didn't cost a penny. And that's all he would do. He would think all day long. <laughs> and he would design experiments, you know. And that's how he came up with this equivalency, which allows for nuclearity, for allows to tap in to the energy in the atom. We'll see. So we're going to have 
hypothetically one photon, which is a particle of light, a photon between our fingers here, and we're gonna release it. I would kind of one second. What is one second? 101. <laughs> I know if, I remember in, in football, in flag football, we'd have to count the Mississippis. Yeah. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, that's just to count sec five seconds. It was right. five Mississippi before you can do the rush. <laughs> okay. So one one Mississippi, okay? One Mississippi. In one second, that photo went from our finger 300,000 kilometers away. In two seconds, it's 600,000 kilometers away. Three seconds, four seconds, 10 seconds, 60 seconds in one minute. <laughs> that thing, not only to Manuka, but it's still traveling, you know, at the speed of light, which is the fastest thing in the universe so far. So in one minute, imagine it's 60 times away, right? That's one minute. In 60 minutes, which is one hour, is another, well, 3,600 mm -hmm. times away because 60 times 60 is 3,600, one hour, times 24 hours, one day, times, I know, I know, it's, it's expanding, times 365 days in one year. I don't know if you ever heard the term one light year yes. away. Yes. See, a light year, People think that it's a measurement of time because it's a light year, but it's not a measure of time. It's a measure of distance. It's the distance that this photon has traveled in a year. Started with one second, 60 seconds, 60 minutes, 24 hours. You know, in one year, we can figure out, in other words, is how many seconds in a year, which is a real number, I don't know how many millions it is, but it's that million. You multiply that many millions times the speed itself, the con which is constant speed, 300,000 kilometers per second. Which was 300,000 kilometers per yes, second. Yes, 300,000 kilometers per second. That gives us, in a year's time, the distance that that photon travels. Now, the distance between planets and galaxies and stellar bodies is measured in millions and billions of light years. That's the scale. It is literally, astro it's mind boggling. It's so, I mean, you wanna talk about losing your mind <laughs> literally into the universe. But it's real, it's there, you know? It's not infinite. It's not, in the speed of light is not infinite. It takes time to get from here to there. It is astonishing. So if we take a mass <clears throat> and we can think of a little mass, I mean, this has mass, but it also has weight. That's why it fell to the ground. <laughs> right. But just the mass of this little cap, I mean, how much mass can be here? Some grams, right? Very, oh, very few grams. That's gonna be M, this little tiny mass. Mm -hmm multiplied times the speed of light square, in other words, 300,000 times 300,000, right? Times this little mass. Is that gonna be a big number or a little number? This MC square. Okay. This little mass multiplied times the speed of light squared. Is that oh, gonna be a little? Is that gonna be a little number or a big number? It's gonna be a smaller number. I mean, I guess it does not vary. Think about it. So this is mass. Let's say that this mass is one gram. Let's make it very simple. One gram. All right. How much is C squared? C is 300,000. Right. Forget about the units. 300,000 kilometers, whatever. But it's 300,000 squared. So that's three times three is nine. Yeah. But plus another six zeros, right? Because it's, it's, it's times itself. Right. It's times, times, times. So it's nine whatever millions. It is. That nine whatever millions times one gram is still the nine whatever millions. Sorry? It's a big number. It's a huge number. Yeah. And that is equal to what? The equivalency yeah. to energy. Yeah. That humongous number 
is the energy that is inside this cap. It's so much to understand for me. You know what? Yes. How can it be? This is nothing. I mean, this is nothing. The energy that is inside this cap is literally astronomical. Where is that energy? That energy is in the molecules and in the atoms. And those are the two of the four fundamental forces. The four fundamental forces. Two are super microscopic and two are humongous. The two that are humongous are gravity and electromagnetism. Electromagnetism. In other words, when electricity goes through wire, it generates simultaneously. Electricity goes in one direction. The electrons are flowing through the wire in a particular direction, right? right. From positive to negative, whatever. But simultaneously, it generates a magnetic field around it, which is perpendicular. And it's like a tube, all right? And it's perpendicular to the flow of the electrons. It simultaneously generates a magnetic field. And that's why it's called electromagnetic. That's one of the four fundamental forces, electromagnetic. The other one is gravity, gravitational pull. Mm -hmm. And the other two are super microscopic, which are the strong force and the weak force, for lack of a more creative name. Mm -hmm. The strong force, imagine what is a strong force. Let's look at the atom for a moment. The core is the protons, the nucleus is the protons, the electrons are orbiting around, all right? And then the neutrons are also associated with the core. They're part of the core with the, the protons. But let's leave the neutrons out for, for now, just protons and electrons. So the nucleus of protons, they also have charge. Protons have a charge, electrons, yeah. Exactly, positive proton, positive proton, and then the electron has to be negative. So the protons are positive, right? Remember when we used to play with magnets and you can make one magnet move? Yes. Because what charges attract each other? The charges that attract each other, char positive, negative, or positive, positive, negative, negative. The ones that attract each other, positive, negative, complementary. Positive attracts negative and negative attracts positive, okay? The complementary. But positive, positive repel each other. Negative, negative also repel each other. So to make the two magnets move, we would first figure out which was the positive negative and then we'd flip the mark and flip one and you can make the other one move by having both positives or both negatives. It makes the other magnet move without touching it. Just push it away like that, all right? Anyway, the point is that positive uh, attracts negative and vice versa and the equal forces repel each other. The protons, they're all positive. Mm -hmm. So what are they doing in the nucleus? Shouldn't they just fly out and have no nucleus? What's keeping those protons together? Oh, the electrons are No, the electrons are outside, are in orbit. The electrons are actually being attracted by the proton. But doesn't, if the electrons are rounded, they're kind of like holding its place? No, no the electrons are not that. touching. The electrons are not That's touching the. I'm not, I'm to yeah, and in <laughs> fact, electrons can fly out. You know, Unless we had the atom. Yeah, the, the nucleus. Isn't right. The protons were in the middle. Exactly in the center, the, the, the nucleus. And then surrounding, so I'm, I'm thinking around like a cell. The, well, the atom, the atomic theory. No protons and electrons. Uh, let's go here for a moment. Uh, um, yeah, yes, this is the standard model of the atomic theory. Uh, the Bohr is also known as the Bohr model. Yeah, this is the this is the nucleus. These are the orbits, right? So this is here showing protons and neutrons in different colors, and then the electrons are orbiting around. Yeah. Mm -hmm, right. Standard theory. Here's a flat okay. diagram okay, of. So uh, we're asking what's holding them in the middle. Yeah. It's a little more here. Lithium, for example, is number three on the periodic table. Right. Hydrogen, helium, and then lithium. Uh -huh. uh, Li, it has three protons and three neutrons also, but the atomic number is established number of protons or electrons, which is the same as protons, right? But you can see the positive are in the nucleus. What's holding them together? If they're positive, shouldn't they be, all these protons should be flying out and we would have really no nucleus. 
there's an invisible glue that is holding them together. And it's called the strong force. It's strong because it's stronger than the repulsion quality of the protons, of the charge. Right. It's so it's stronger than the charge, right? But it can only, it has an effect only in a tiny distance. In other words, the protons have to be literally next to each other. If the protons separate more than the diameter of the proton itself, they fly out, they disperse. And they disperse releasing the energy. Another word for that is splitting the atom. And what comes out of splitting the atom? A nuclear bomb, an atomic reaction. So that's the energy that's inside this mass. It's an atomic bomb energy. It's just amazing. And Einstein is the one who kind of put it together <laughs> or gave us at least the mathematical formula. Sí, lo pasaba, bueno. Uh, yeah, con Benítez. <laughs> it's been there. It's in there in the deep recesses. <laughs> yep. So that's why I put matter slash energy because they can be converted back and forth just with Einstein's formula. Okay. But that whole composite, all the matter and all the energy of the universe that we can actually measure, it's only 5%. It's so, so what's the other 95%? The other 9% are dark matter and energy. What's dark matter with purpose? Exactly. So dark, because we can't really measure it. All right, it's not that we can't see it with our eyes, we can't really measure it because electricity we cannot see, but we can measure. So that would be visible energy. Dark matter. Dark matter uh, is dark because it's very dense. It's extremely dense. Now we're talking about gravity here. It's so dense that not even a photon is capable of exp of um, of uh, fleeing or escaping dark matter. A photon is trapped. That's how dense it is. Okay. And so, what's one example of dark matter? A black hole. What are black holes? Black holes essentially are galaxies. that are so dense <clears throat> this is a better more realistic that uh, not even light escapes a black hole but this is basically galaxy it's estimated that most galaxies today actually have a black hole at the center it is matter that collapses upon itself more matter because <clears throat> let's say a comet comes by and if the comet enters the atmosphere of the earth mm -hmm. there's a chance what's the chance that uh, first we'll see a streak if it's at night we'll see a streak of light what is that streak of light which is going to be a reddish type of light. What is producing that light from a comet that zoomed by our what atmosphere? Producing the, light? the light, the reddish light. The fact that it's reddish, orangey reddish, what is called? Eh? Are, are we going back to the sun? No, no, fire. no. It's a night fire. It's the fire. And what's firing up the comet? What's, why is the comet burning? Yes. The comet is burning because the comet is coming in at such a speed that when it enters the atmosphere, the friction that that speed is causing with the air around it ignites the air and the comet into fire, plasma state, because of the friction, the friction. Right, right, right. Okay, it's so intense because of the speed that is going through the atmosphere. And so we see a streak of, of red. Now, if that comet 
were to come close enough to the actual crust of the earth, you know, and not the out outer atmosphere, that comet most likely is gonna happen what? It's gonna start breaking up because it got so, it's gonna get red hot and then it's gonna get white hot and then it's gonna burst, okay? And the bursting is gonna fragment into smithering pieces. What do you expect those pieces to do? Collapse into the earth. They're gonna be, they're gonna have a trajectory, an elliptical trajectory until they collapse into the earth. And sometimes they go one or two miles into the crust of the earth, like that huge meteorite that went into Yucatan and produced the explosion that extinguished the dinosaur 65 million years ago. <laughs> so <clears throat> why did it come into earth? Why did those why did those fragments were sucked into the earth, were pulled into the earth? Instead of just keeping going into the they, they space. Have, um, yes. Yeah. They must have traveled into, I guess, a part of the atmosphere where gravity. Well, so is any atmosphere exempt from gravity? Because uh, gravity is a radial force, right? It comes from the center of the earth. Right. And is well, radiating. In well, this is out, yeah, but around the atmosphere. Right. In fact, what's holding the atmosphere around the Earth? I it's also it is gravity. Okay. Gas okay. is okay. It gravity. It, gravity gravity is pulling the gas around the Earth, and so that it keeps that comes through. Through it breaks up into fragments, and then the fragments are being subject to gravity, and they collapse in. My whole point about this is that the collapsing in. Mm -hmm. All right. When we expand that large to planetary system, it's a process called accretion, mm -hmm. which is actually the next slide <laughs> that I plan to get to. Accretion, which is the collapse of matter onto itself. If we collapse more and more matter, is gravity increasing or decreasing? See, this is the primitive Earth that is getting bombarded by other fragments of stuff that's floating around the universe. If more and more fragments come into the earth, fragments of rocks, huge like mountain size or pieces of planets that are floating, that are flying through at incredible speeds, they keep collapsing into the earth because of the earth's gravity. Is the earth's gravity increasing or decreasing in mass? As it gets more stuff, if you have jello and you start putting raisins into the jello, are you increasing or decreasing? Increasing. increasing. Right. More stuff is collapsing into the earth, right. so more mass is being added into the earth. Okay. More mass increases or decreases gravity? Increases. Increases. The more density I have, the more gravity there is. So with more gravity, what's it going to do? It's going to pull even more mass, and it creates a self-feeding, a positive feedback mechanism of pulling in even more and more mass until that mass, until it pulls in all the mass that is within the radius of its gravitational field. Because at some point, some of these fragments are gonna be so far away that the gravitational field is gonna be very tiny because it's too distant from the core. Mm -hmm. And so that piece of rock escaped the gravitational field. It's gonna go through, but everything around it is gonna get cleaned up and sucked into the earth. And eventually the earth and all the other planets as they orbit around the sun, they clean out everything, all the other fragments that are around them. And that's why space is fairly clean between the different planets of our solar system because all those comets and asteroids and meteorites that were floating around got sucked into the various planets. They've made the planets that we have today, the eight planets, okay? There are a couple of asteroid belts that I'll show you still floating around. Uh, but basically, so it increases with this accretion process, right? That's the general term, accretion. It increases the, dense, the density of the, of the mass of the planet, right? So, uh, and why was I talking about this? Oh, yes. Now, you expand that to a level of a galaxy. What's collapsing into the center of the, of the galaxy is entire solar systems, not just an Earth picking up whatever fragments are floating around, but we're talking about entire solar systems getting sucked into 
a mass in here that is so incredibly dense because it has sucked in so many solar systems, <laughs> all right? Thousands, maybe millions of solar systems has become so dense that now not even light gets out because it's super, super dense. It's too, the gravitational field is gazillion Gs, you know, G for gravity. When a rocket takes off, you hear that the astronauts experience two and three Gs yeah. of their bodies, right? It's twice the gravitational field. It's like when we accelerate in a car, we push back into the sea. That's a little tiny acceleration. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, again, the numbers are literally astronomical, but the fact that black holes do exist. But how do we know if they're opaque? In other words, if light doesn't get out, how do I know that there's anything in this, at the center of this black hole? I know because of what is known as the lensing effect, lensing from a lens. You see the lensing effect here? Look at the edge, the stars or whatever these probably distant galaxies we know now, we will call them stars for now for the discussion. These look fairly, excuse me, round and circular, right? But as you know, as they approach the black hole, they get more streaky. Oh, yeah. And even most, and here, even most streaky. But actually, what we're seeing here is that this is what we would call the night sky. This is the backdrop. This is el telón de allá atrás. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the backdrop. So these stars or galaxies are millions of light years away from the black hole. In other words, the black hole is actually in the foreground. And this background is behind but when the light from those stars is coming our way and it approaches where the dark hole is, this gravitational field generates a bending of the light. It bends the light, literally. It makes it bend, right? Because light is a photon, but that's the chameleon. I'm using <laughs> the, the terms, uh, and, um, Einsteinian terms, but... He talked about a, a chameleon quality of, uh, of light, that it is a wave, but it's also a particle. So it has particle, uh, actually has particle light properties, which will react to gravity. And it has wave light -like properties, which can travel in space, in vacuum. Mm -hmm. All right, a wave can travel. All right, so what happens is, <clears throat> The black, the black hole has such a high density that it creates like a spheric lens around it, like a fish eye, you know, that has a thick lens like that. And so when we see the light coming from behind the black hole, as it goes through that gravitational field, the lensing effect, it's literally what it's called, it bends the light and it distorts the light. And it gives it this pattern, this aura. And then when we get out of the aura going outward, we see that the uh, uh, that the individual galaxies look like streaks. And the further we get away from the center, the more natural, normal they look. But this is a distortion of the reality. And the distortion is because there's a black hole. In other words, think about it. If this is the background, and this is actually just a hole, we should be able to see the same background, right? All the little dots back here, but no, we don't see anything. That's because there's something in the middle here. We can't see it because the light can get out, but that, we call it a black hole. And it's estimated that pretty much most galaxies have at the center a black hole, including the Milky Way. So in a few trillion years, we're gonna get sucked into the black hole and, and just we won't compressed. Be good. We won't be here. We won't be here. We'll watch that show, God willing, from front row seats. So that's dark matter. If we were to like add all the black holes of the universe, all right, all hypothetically. Is dark matter? Yes, because oh. we can't see it. So that all of the dark holes of the trillions of galaxies that are there, right? And that only makes up for about 25% more, about one quarter more of the matter <laughs> in the universe. So 
Okay. So dark, dark matter is approximately 27% yep. of the universe. Right. And it's composed of black holes. Mostly black holes, at least so far that we have been able to discover. Because keep in mind, the discovery right. is an in indirect discovery. We don't know exactly how dense it is. We can do some estimates and so forth, but it's indirect because we cannot really put it on a scale and say, oh, this is how much it weighs. <laughs> Okay, but it's real. I mean, the lensing effect is real, has been measured, has been uh, verified in multiple times in, in observations around the entire globe, no matter which way we look at the night sky. So if we add these two, we're at about 30%, about one third of, uh, of the universe, of the components of the universe. Still, two thirds are still left, okay? And so the two thirds that are left are called dark energy because it's not matter, it's not, uh, doesn't react to gravity, right? And so it's dark energy. And so the word dark here is used for a different reason. It's dark energy because we're totally in the dark as to what this is. So you might as well call it, we, just have no idea. we have no idea what it is. We just know it's there because two-thirds of the universe is unaccounted for. After we measure all of the visible matter and energy, in other words, after we add up all of the galaxies of the universe. Two-thirds? Two-thirds. 68%. Wait a minute. Two-thirds of the universe we do not know about. We do not know. We have no idea. You might as well call, you call it dark energy just to call it something. We could call it scrumption or machimchi, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, conceptually, it's very important because it, it boggles the mind. We're so used to, you know, matter. <laughs> Everything is matter around us. But that matter is a very, very tiny component of the actual universe where we're immersed. Know what else to call it. Yeah, yeah. So we know it's not matter because we can account for about 30% of the matter on the universe uh, from what we've measured, which is the sum of all galaxies and including the black holes and all that. But still there is a 70% of the universe that has to be there according to these astronomical calculations. I don't know. Don't don't ask me how they come up with like with a hundred percent okay of cosmology. I think it has to do part with what's called background radiation. We'll get into background radiation in a minute. But basically, this uh, this thing, this entity that is out there, is not matter because we can account between visible and dark matter that is going to be about thirty percent, about one third. But this other two thirds, we just have no clue but we know that it has to be there. And it has to be there uh, mostly because of what is known as the background radiation. Background radiation is this. This is actually, this is not a painting. This is an actual uh, colorized photograph, <laughs> if you will, of the universe uh, as it's expanding. And But this is the background. In other words, this is what's left over from the first explosion of the universe, which we call it the Big Bang. Uh, the physicists call it singularity, all right? But from that explosion, something was left over that's still floating around. And that's why it's called background, background radiation. We saw this picture with, when we were looking at the first class, we're talking about evolution. Yes. At the point, I yes. Because I talked, about, I talked about matter and energy right. and the origin of the universe because we we're looking at three origins. We're look, the origin of the universe, the origin of life on Earth and then the origin of humans as right. a species. Right. Those are the three big origin questions, right? Uh, All right, give me a pause on the release of- Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Be right back. Mm -hmm. <coughs> 
No, let's, okay, let's do pause share, pause recording, pause recording. Okay, we assume recording. So this background radiation, astronomers and astrolog astronomers tell us that uh, this is what's left over from the Big Bang, all right? And uh, that has to be measured and dated also in time. And that's the that number that you hear around 13.7, uh, billion years ago, almost 14 billion years. So here's just a, a diagram, a simplistic a schematic of if the Big Bang happened here, right? Uh, there are two main uh, time scales that happened or two main events. Mm -hmm. The first one is called inflation and the other one is called expansion. So inflation is here at the very beginning from Right, if there's a bang, there's a bomb going off, there's an, an, an inflation, and then there's an expansion. So the inflation is here first, and then this one is the expansion. The actual cone is the expansion, right? But they're opposite ends of the time scale because inflation occurred in the first fractions of a second, where, where 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 20 seconds. <laughs> okay, first fractions of a second. And that's where most of the elements uh, were formed. Or the, the um, subatomic particles of protons, uh, electrons, and neutrons. And then comes the expansion stage, which is measured in millions of years. <laughs> Up to thousands of millions of years, which is our border here. 13,000 million years or 13 billion years. All right. And you can see more or less representing what happened at different phases. The inflation is here. It's just incredibly intense. Why? Because <laughs> let's say we run the clock backwards. Okay. Uh, before that, this guy, this is the Hubble telescope named after Edmund Hubble, who was a uh, astronomer, I think in the 40s or 50s. Anyway, this Hubble telescope is an actual telescope, but it was our first, uh, the first telescope that was put in orbit mm -hmm. around the earth, outside of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. What advantage is that? Because we've had telescopes on earth since Galileo and even before, you know, uh, looking outside of the atmosphere. Now. Outside of the atmosphere. So you're measuring. Well, the atmosphere is negligible when we consider the size of of stuff that we're measuring. Right. All right. So it's not a question of of distance necessarily. It's rather the interference, because the atmosphere acts as a filter and as a glare. Exactly. It's yeah, it's a filter and it's a glare because the atmosphere has atoms and molecules and there's light that's bouncing against them and so forth. So it creates, it's a little bit like when you see the road and it looks wavy because mm -hmm. it's hot. Yes. That's interference, yeah. but that's heat interference. All right. It's just heat interference. Uh, with the atmosphere is molecular interference, it's atomic interference. And so to bypass that horrible, nasty filter, <laughs> uh, the, the illumination, the creativity of the astronomers was to, do, well, why don't we just bypass it and put a, 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 um, a telescope out there in the, beyond the atmosphere where there's no interference. It's just black uh, universe, <laughs> okay? And that's what Hubble did. And so the Hubble telescope. And so you can see it's kind of like a cannon, you know, it's a cylinder and it has a top that opens up and closes. Uh, all right. So the Hubble measured the distance between galaxies in a very accurate way. And it because, uh, yeah, to fractions of millimeters, all right. And uh, because the Hubble has been going around for years. <clears throat> The overall information is that 
the distance between all galaxies was getting larger. Expanding. Automatically. You know, if the distance is getting smaller, we're on contraction. <laughs> right. But if the distance stayed the same, then the universe is stable. But no, and that's why it's presented like a cylinder, like uh, like a not a cylinder, but like a cone, a cone, a sabriendose. In other words, the big discovery of Hubble is that of the Hubble telescope that the universe is expanding. But the expansion goes along with time, right? In time, it's expanding. So if we hypothetically reverse the clock, it would be contracting, and so it would contract to a singularity to where all the universe would be collapsed into a single point, but it's a mathematical point. It's a mathematical point. It's not a dot. Like I can put a dot on this screen with a pencil, all right? But that dot at the microscopic level has mass, has graphite, has atoms. Mm -hmm. a, a point, mathematical point is one dimension. So normally we're used to three dimensions, right? height, depth, and and width. So three-dimensional, everything that we see, all the matter that's around, it's all three-dimensional. All right. So that's a volume. A plane is how many dimensions? Surface. Surface is one. Two dimensions. Height and length is two dimensions. 2D. 3D is volume. Sphere, circle, or flat, the screen is two dimensions, right? What's one dimension? It's a mathematical concept. It's That's why the physicists call it singularity. 1D, you know, we can only talk about it in the abstract. The universe started as a singularity. All that we see, all this immensely big, stuff that weighs incredible was collapsed into a single point <laughs> mathematically the moment of singularity and that's why who came up with the theory of the big bang george lemaitre a priest jesuit belgian i think it was in the 50s and I ask you if you've ever been to any of those jesuit don't, don't the jesuits run the observatories yeah the vatican yeah, at the Vatican, and also here in Tucson, in Arizona, Tucson. is a Vatican and Observatory that, in Tucson. But not everybody's allowed in there. Well, some areas they they give tours of some of the parts. And I, I've never been, never been, uh, but uh, yeah, yeah. You know who has a little uh, astronomical thing mm, observatory is Belen. Oh yeah, that's yeah. That's right. Padre Cartaya, Pedro Cartaya is the astronomer. He's an astronomer. Jesuit, yeah, <laughs> and the back side of UM, I discovered they have a little observatory also towards St. Augustine on that road, the back road that goes through the fields. Yeah, next time, fields? yeah, next time you drive by there slowly, you have, you have the baseball field, yes, and the circle that is St. Augustine, yes, right, yes, yes. go for the if you were going, let's say, Museum. from buildings are there, yes, you're right. From St. Augustine to uh, Doctor's Hospital. Yes. Okay. Yes. Slowly look at the buildings, at the top of the buildings, and you see a little dome. Yes. Yes. Now, those observatories are hampered by all, all the lights that we have here. All you know, so it's very basic, rudimentary stuff. But anyway, uh, yes, expanding. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. A gentleman there. Telescopes. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. It's amazing. Really, yes. Yeah. That's right. And the technology and sophistication. Uh, so, anyway, to put this guy out there was just spectacular. And that's one of the per, one of the most fundamental observations of the Hubble was the expanding universe, and that confirmed experimentally the uh, um, theory, and in fact, um, Einstein had to recant. He had a, he, he uh, elaborated a universal constant at one point that to allow for a stable universe. 
and he had to recant it because uh, he realized that the universe was actually expanding. And that it was, it's not only expanding at a um, constant speed, which would be velocity. You know, we go on the expressway 55 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. That's constant speed. No, it's acceleration. 55, I'm pressing the accelerator. Right. I don't have the autopilot. Right. And so expanding means that it's going faster and faster and faster and faster. So when we reverse that, what do we do? We run down the clock down to zero, to the moment of singularity. And so time and space are related. He, in fact, Einstein also talked about the time-space continuum. We necessarily, when we talk about time, it has to be in a particular space and vice versa. We talk about space at what time? <laughs> All right, so it's the it's the it's the uh, fourth dimension actually right so three dimension is volume the fourth dimension is the time space continuum at what time in what place and at what time that volume so the 3d what when and where is the fourth dimension right and that's why the rock group, the fifth dimension. <laughs> and I remember a group way back, it was called the fifth dimension. When the moon is at the ta -da -da, and Jupiter, and it was a song about yes. the planets, the yeah. Aquarius, yeah. the dawn of Aquarius, remember the hippie yeah. times? <laughs> Aquarius, remember the dawn of Aquarius? Oh. Yeah. And the group was called the fifth dimension. <laughs> In other words, it was beyond anything that was known. It was even beyond time and place. And it was like an astronomical hippie group. It was the times of love and peace <laughs> and, and Woodstock. <laughs> Incredible. We've seen a lot of history. All right, so what about this? Well, the origin of the universe. This is just to make the point that due to the, oh, here's the background radiation. So the first stuff, that could be measured. See this uh, painting in blue here, uh -huh. right? In different shades of blue and yellow and green. Looks very similar to this. Wait, it's, explain to me again the difference between accretion and differentiation. We'll get there. Oh, okay. That's the next slide. That's the fourth slide out of 30 something slides. Same thing going back. Yeah, going back in time. Yeah, you can think it's kind of, uh, it's not accretion, okay? Okay. Going back, because this is an experiment that is only hypothetical, it cannot be done. Okay. Okay. So because, so yeah, yeah, accretion is different. Accretion, it's a different, uh, it's a different concept and different reality. This going back, we can only do hypothetically as a mental experiment, because we're fixed in time and place. In fact, time has already passed since we started this conversation, <laughs> and Thank we will never, back. and we will never regain it. It's water under the bridge forever, right? Okay, so, but the the the, uh, the exciting thing is that Lemaitre, being a priest and being an astrophysicist by profession, all right, came up with the theory of the Big Bang, uh, and he was quoted once as saying that some people choose to examine the universe from the physical reality, and other people choose to examine the universe from the spiritual reality. And he says, I have chosen both. And so before we can ask the hypothetical question, if this is a moment of singularity, when time and space began, what was there before? Nothing. And so if we go from nothing to something, we call that creation. Ex nihilo, from nothing. Right? And in fact, it's not just something from nothing, it's everything from nothing. Because if the whole universe would start at singularity, then the whole universe is contained in that singularity. So it's from nothing, everything. It's the act of creation. Now, yeah, the word in the Hebrew context of dabar, dabar, which is the word in Hebrew. Now, 
Let's go to the book of Genesis. The first book of the Bible. The first chapter of the book. The first verse of that chapter. In the beginning. So in Hebrew, Bereshit. When the earth was a formless wasteland. Now keep in mind, this is language that is pre-scientific. All right? Or non-scientific. It's trying to explain to people who it's because <clears throat> these were words that were written down several millennia before the time of Christ, about 3,000 years before the time of Christ. And the scientific revolution didn't come about in the 1500s, you know, with Copernicus and all that after Christ. So these are words that were physically written to a people, to the people of God, the Jewish people, thousands and thousands of years before the scientific revolution. So they're definitely pre-scientific. They don't study scientifically. All right? right. But let's follow this. Let's follow that just for a moment. So, in the beginning, Bereshit, when the earth was a formless wasteland, the formless wasteland is form, all right? Formless means that it's chaos. Remember, we talk about the Agon and the and the uh, the the two Jewish traditions of the origin of the universe, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and how they talk about the conflict. One was conflict, and then that conflict resolution results in the universe. But the other one is formless. It means that essentially nothing, because we can't really have formless. Everything has a form beyond the shape. It's the noun, it's the substantive, right? And so formless means essentially void. Today we would say void, nothing, no. Right. No and void, okay? There was nothing. God said, Nabar, let there be what? What's the first creation? Let there be light. That sounds like an explosion. That sounds like singularity. <laughs> that sounds like the biggest bang that's ever been, the biggest light that's ever been. Inflation, boom, here we go. <laughs> Hang on to your seats. In fractions of seconds, the, uh, sub, the, the subatomic particles were created for the possibility of making atoms, of making molecules, of making planetary systems, of making universes. <laughs> and I guess you think that's just a random explosion. Event. Exactly. So, right. And so, <clears throat> see, from nothing, everything. And in Genesis, it's there. God said, and let there be light, and there was light, <laughs> because that's creation, <laughs> okay? And God saw how good it was, first day, yeom, day in Hebrew. Then, the second day, separation, because for them, it was the waters, the, thing. the waters above, the waters below, remember the flood waters that would open up and would get drenched, okay? So again, pre-scientific, they didn't understand that clouds of water vapor that are floating in the atmosphere had no concept of, of molecules, vapor, or anything like that. Okay, so they see just rain falling from above, from above. So there's got to be some water up there above <laughs> to come down, and then in the basins and so forth. So the separation, God saw how good it was. The second day, uh, we have the oceans and and the rains. Then the third day, I don't know what happens, but finally on the fourth day. God says, let us make the luminaries, okay? The luminous bodies, okay? And he creates the major luminary and the lesser luminary. Mm -hmm. And what are those two luminaries? To separate day from night. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, strictly speaking, the two luminaries, we know that the sun is a luminous object because it's fire. But we know today, scientifically, that the moon is not a luminous body, it's an opaque body, but at night it looks luminous because of the reflection. Again, pre-scientific, they had no clue about any of that, all right? But they see it as a luminary, as illuminating. In fact, moon shadow, moon can actually create a shadow at night, you know, it's that strong. And so, and the fourth day. Now, what determines a day of 24 hours? Uh, day and night, right. the, sun. the sun. If the sun was created on the fourth day, right? How can that word day yom be a day of twenty-four hours? Well, it can't, because there were three days before the sun was created, <laughs> right. and therefore there has to be an alternative interpretation. This is with regards to the fundamentalists that see day as twenty-four hours, 
and in seven days of creation of 24 hours. So the world was created in a week. <laughs> you know, the universe was created in a week. Using, no. our, we're using our limits. Yes. So we, interpret. exactly. We're interpreting within our limits. Right? Yes. In other words, we're interpreting the word ye, uh, yeom, day, as a 24 hour day. But if we do that, fundamentalistically, you know, we run into problems because the day didn't exist until day three. <laughs> And so the alternative is to interpret Yom as a time period. And if you look up the Hebrew translation of Yom, it can either be a day of 24 hours or a time period, a discrete time period. And when we talk about time period, there goes evolutionary time in there. We don't name the author of Genesis days, do we? Yes, we do. Really? First of all, Genesis is one of the longest books in the Bible. It's got 50 chapters, all right? And it has at least four sources. Four sources. There is, and we covered this, the Yahweh's, the Yahweh's, the Deuteronomist, the um, Elohist, and the priestly, the priestly tradition. Genesis 1, the first chapter of Genesis, where the narrative of creation occurs, is from the priestly tradition. Now, what priests are this? The thousands of years before Christ. So can they be Catholic priests? No, they're Jewish priests. They were running the temple, right? The sacrifice and the temple. Now we know that most religions have had priests. They're Buddhist priests, they're Hindu priests, they do their thing. They're Santeria priests. <laughs> All right, so most religions have a priest, they're the official ones who run the, the business. Right. Okay. So the Jewish priest, what was the day of rest for the Jews? The Sabbath, the Shabbat, which is what day of the week? The seventh, the Saturday, that's based on the Greek calendar of Saturn, <laughs> Saturn day, right? Monday, Tuesday, Thor day. Uh, uh, but uh, um, Saturday, the seventh day, the Shabbat, is a day of rest. And so the, the Genesis 1, the story of creation actually goes First day, second day, event. on the sixth day, God creates the human. Let us make man in our image and likeness, male and female, we create him. We, so it's the Trinitarian God acting there, right? On the seventh day, God saw all of creation, how good it was, and it was very good. And what did God do on the seventh day? I take a nap, because I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> So it's the the universe of the exactly done now you people run it or destroy it and so the jewish priest can say to the jewish people if god rested on the seventh day who are you not to rest see so to enforce this the shabbat that is known as the priestly narrative and in fact it is thought these are the biblical scholars now i'm just parroting what i've heard before the, the scripture scholars tell us that that was from this priestly tradition that was very organized, very systematic also, first day, second day, third day, so that they can land on the seventh day of the rest of the Shabbat. But also, it's a abstract God, it's an impersonal God, it's a God who is almighty and powerful, and don't you dare, because I created the singularity. <laughs> so don't even think about coming close to me, right? <clears throat> Genesis 2. So the heavens and the earth were made in seven days, but the earth was uh, had all these plants and animals. But now Yahweh, and for the first time in the narrative, the word Yahweh is introduced, right? And so that is called the Yahweh's tradition, which is a different author, all inspired by the Holy Spirit. So that's why we say we have many different human authors. The four Gospels have four different human authors, but how many divine authors? One divine author, the Holy Spirit. All 73 books of the Bible have one divine author, and that's what keeps it together. For the rest, they're all human, different. So second chapter of Genesis. <clears throat> God is going to create the human. So he takes clay, right? Mud, molds it, 
and breathes into the statue. Now, and who comes out of there? Adam, right? Now, Adam in Hebrew is ha adam. Clay, mud, earth, soil is ha adama. So it's a plain word. Adam is not the first name of the first guy, you know. It just means human. In fact, human has man in it, all right? So man comes from Adam, and Ha Adam comes from Ha Adama. In other words, the human comes from the soil. In a different context, later it says, you are dirt, and to dirt you shall return. Mm -hmm. When we rot, we become part of the elements. So you see, there's a cycle there. This is poetic language. This is symbolic language that would mean something to those Hebrew people who had no clue about evolution or natural selection or any of the atomic theory <laughs> or astronomy. Okay? But it's a poetic because these are called the myth, the um, uh, mythological narratives. Those are the sacred mythologies. Every religion, whether it's monotheistic or poly, look at the 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 Greek mythology is very rich with all the gods and goddesses and mixing with the humans and it's super rich, but it's all fantastic, right? So every religion has their myth, their myths, and these are our myths of creation. In second, then Adam. So what happened to and Adam is by himself. In fact, Yahweh is very personable. He walks with Adam in the garden. And they're having a conversation. And then God plays a trick on Adam. What does God do? He processes in front of Adam all the animals and says, go name them. And Adam is saying there, Adam names all the animals. Mm -hmm. But after naming all the animals, what is naming the animal being? Giraffe, Hikotea, whatever. Mm -hmm. What is he naming? Grammatically, what is that? The name okay. is the noun. Oh, yes. Sure. It's the substantive. Okay, okay, okay. What does that mean? That means that Adam knew the substance of each one of those animals. A lizard doesn't know it's a lizard, but we know it's a lizard. Right. Okay. So Adam knew the substance. Adam was a philosopher. Adam was thinking in contrast with others that didn't think. They go by instinct. So Adam knew the substance of each animal was able to name them. And after the, all the animals processed, the big and the small, what happens? He ran out of animals. And he, he felt sad because he saw no substance like his own substance. And so God is done with this trick and says, okay, Adam, go to sleep for a while. <laughs> and we're going to create another one like you. <laughs> Takes out the rib. The rib is again symbolic. It's not that you have one more rib than we do, okay, is that uh, <clears throat> when Adam wakes up, there's Eve, <laughs> okay? And what does Adam say? Whoa! <laughs> Remember, they were innocent, they were naked, and they were immortal, and they were fair, just, they had the preternatural gifts. Yeah. So Adam naturally goes, whoa! This is Flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. <laughs> Finally, I found my compliment. So see how it makes this poetic. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's innocent. We have to try to interpret it in that sense. How God, that's God's original plan. You know? Now, let's go to Cuba <laughs> for a moment. The Cuba? Yeah, because okay. what is the name of the first woman in the Bible? Eve. Eve, which is Eva. Eva. Which you know, I didn't. I didn't want to la Eva. I didn't want to say anything when you were saying when Adam woke up and saw this is my. I was thinking if he was Cuban, he would say mi Eva. Con suerte, <laughs> viste que hebas. <laughs> Why? Because the H is interchangeable with the J. And in Arabic or in the Middle East languages and in Hebrew, it's pronounced, it's aspirated, and in Spanish, it's mute. 
depending on where it falls on the sentence or in the word. That's where it comes from. Yeah, it's okay. It's what is when you know. So <laughs> next time you hear that word, you can chuckle. Can I, can I use that as an educational Please do. Please do because it's so much fun. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? Oh, you know, ha Adama and Heba. There they go. <laughs> And they were so intelligent and they had free will and they got so cocky that they decided to go against God's will and messed up, up for the rest of us. And the first thing we lost was the innocence and the last thing we lost was the fairness. Okay, and it has been unjust ever since. Okay, so I'm... Yeah. How... The only reason I'm asking is because the baby's at my grandson. Yeah. How in the world, uh, by the way, we're on, <laughs> we're on, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> okay. Well, look, we're in slide four and there are 34 slides. <laughs> so the rest is coming to you via technology okay. of a video. Okay. <laughs> because there's absolutely no way that in three minutes or four. <laughs> Absolutely. No, 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 no. Relax, relax. 1230 is our limit here. All right. And I've really been too arrogant to go into too much detail, but I figured I'd do the background also because we hadn't met in a while and we covered a little bit of this at the first course, which was a year ago at this point. You see, that's the thing because, and that's why I didn't want to go precisely because uh, I have you as a, as a private student now, as a tutoring student. I took my time with it because I knew that I have this video, <laughs> say, plus the plus the uh, the PowerPoint, okay? But, uh, so, yes, uh, that's the origin of the universe and all this to come up with this number here. I don't know if it's large enough to be seen from where you're at, but basically 13 point, yeah. It's in, uh, in billions, so it's uh, 10 to the 9 is billions. So here would be 13.7 billion. We can round it up to 14 billion because this is an approximation anyway. <laughs> okay. Uh, about 14 billion years ago. We can say then with our best astronomy and physics and, and cosmology that the Big Bang occurred. 14 billion years ago, which I find totally fascinating that we can say, yes, God is the creator, and we can actually tell you when he did that. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> yes, exactly. That's exactly right. Uh, George Lumet, right? So that's the origin of the universe. I want to look at, uh, just, I just want to do inflation and expansion, okay? So inflation which was this first nanoseconds here. Accretion? No, no, inflation and expansion. Forget about accretion for now. Accretion is going to be so the planets. And expansion. and expansion, yeah. Inflation is the first fragments of a second after the Big Bang. And expansion is the rest of the millions of years, the cone. That's expansion is the rest. So they're the two opposite time scales, the incredibly fast and the incredibly slow. The first second after the, the first time fractions time. of the second. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was the other? Expansion is the rest. Expansion is the cone, the cone of expansion. Yeah. And it's measured in billions of years, which is in the opposite end of the scale, you know, up to 14 billion. So we cannot talk about what happened 15 billion, 15 billion years after the Big Bang, because we haven't been here. Okay. So look at here. So time begins, right, with the Big Bang. Now you see sec, S-E, I don't know, can you see that? Uh, all right, second, this stands for second, right? 
10 to the minus 43. So for example, if I take a second and, and I split it in half, that would be 10 to the one half or 10 to the minus two, right? We can revert, we can invert the fraction into a negative exponent and go back. So half a second will be 10 to the minus two. Uh, one, uh, one quarter of a second would be 10 to the minus four. You could split, keep cutting into the second. And now right? second was the it's 10 to the minus nine because nano is nine. That's the nanosecond, 10 to the minus nine. It's one ninth of a second. All right. Uh, so that's 10 to the minus 43. Yes. So he's saying that approximately it was 10 to the minus 43 seconds. And so the inflation, yes. Exactly. Well, these are very sophisticated. Um, calculations that are done with what are known as the supercomputers that can crunch the numbers, huge numbers. They simply, well, here's, here's an example. Let's say Hubble in year one, measure the distance between star A and B, okay, was one millimeter. <laughs> uh, year two right. was two millimeters. Right. Year three was three millimeters, so they're expanding at a millimeter per year. Right. All right, then they can also figure out at what distance it is from here. So they can figure out that millimeter at that distance is how many millions of miles from each other. And it took how much time to do that. So then reverse it when they came back into be a single, right? How much time ago did that occur? Mm -hmm. So there's a way of doing it, but the numbers are so huge. The crunching is so large that the computer will explode. <laughs> the normal computer will just frizzle. You burn the the center, the the, the what is that called? The memory chip, the um, the processor. Uh -huh. will get so hot that it would go into fire. <laughs> it would burn out exactly. <laughs> so they do the supercomputers that are kept at minus forty degrees, uh, whatever, to so they don't heat up too much, and they go back to this. You know, but it's hypothetical. The interesting thing is that this inflation is when the subatomic particles develop, all right? Uh, and that's why this is painted in a white, in a um, positive, and this one is in a negative, mm -hmm. and then others that don't have a charge, those would be the neutrons. Hmm? This is a great slide. Yeah, it's good. It's very very informative, very informative, okay? But, uh, okay, so we take a molecule, molecule, let's say H2O, Water is it's a molecule, right? A single molecule water. How many atoms in H2O? First, how many elements? How many elements? H2O. Two. Which are which elements? Hydrogen. Okay. Now, how many atoms of hydrogen? H2O. How many atoms of oxygen? One, because it's not, it's like if I say A is one A, right? It's implied. The right. one is implied. Okay, right. so one oxygen, two hydrogens. A total, how many atoms total in one molecule of water? Three. Three. Two and one is three. Right. So a total of three atoms. Two of hydrogen, one of oxygen. All right, that's one molecule. So I can take that molecule of water and I can split it into three atoms. Right? right? Okay, let's stay with the atom of oxygen. I can split the atom of oxygen into its fundamental particles, into what is known as the subatomic particles. Mm -hmm. What are the subatomic particles? The three standard subatomic particles, two have charge, one that has no charge. Yeah. Exactly. What makes the nucleus? Of those three particles, yeah. The neutrons. the neutrons and the protons. the protons. Okay, so I split the oxygen atom mm -hmm. into electrons, let them fly out, and I, I just have now the protons and the neutrons. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going to strip away the neutrons. Now I just have the protons left. Right. That's a subatomic particle. That's one of the three so fundamental. The strip everything out except the protons. No, no. Subatomic is just what it means. 
their subatomic particles. They're the okay. particles that make the atom. Okay. So they're subatomic. Okay. Right? It's like the motor is part of the car. <laughs> right. And the tires and the seat is also part of the car. So mm -hmm. all those parts of the car are sub-car, sub-automobile parts. <laughs> right. right. Okay. So subatomic is just the particles that make up the atom. Right. And the three standard are proton, electron, and neutron. They have now found other particles also, but it gets complicated. So let's stay with the standard model. All right. Subatomic particles have also been split. If I take a proton, if I take a hammer and hit this phone enough, I can pulverize it. Right. And then if I take that, that, powder sand, and I keep pounding it more, I can even pulverize it even more. So we're pulverizing in, the proton now, is what you're telling me? Yes, how can we pulverize, can we pulverize the proton? In other words, what is the fundamental particle of, of right, matter? Right. What is it's its smallest? Back. Going back to smaller, smaller, smaller. Can I split, I can split the atom into protons, electrons, and neutrons. Can I split the proton, for example, or the neutron? The electron is harder to split because it has negligible mass. You know, the mass is ethereal. It's like going through a cloud. There is, right. But the, the proton and the neutron, they do have significant mass. They do have mass. Very tiny, but it's there. So can I split the proton? Is the proton made up of other stuff oh, that is more mass. small? Doesn't have to be. It no, could be. Okay. The proton could be the fundamental, fundamental. particle of matter. You know, and the neutron, it could stop there. So how do we find out? What hammer can we use to split a proton if the if the hammer is made up of protons? <laughs> if I take a car and I ram it into a building, the car can split up into pieces, right? Right, so you need another kind of- So if I take two force. protons, if I take two protons and accelerate them to maybe half the speed of light, in opposite direction and then have them run into each other right. and see if they break up or if they just bounce off each other mm -hmm. you know or if they destroy the machine <laughs> but if i speed them up to very significant speed and have them crash against each other a ver que pasa. you know do the experiment <laughs> those are called the accelerators Right? There's one, they're also called colliders, hadron colliders. There's mm -hmm. one in Switzerland and, and uh, France. Actually, it's so large, it has several kilometers of diameter. It's a huge yeah, magnetic tube. Because clearly they've done this before. Yes, I, I, I was fortunate to visit that uh, the hadron collider in uh, underneath Switzerland one time. And uh, there was another one here in the United States. Okay, that's how they test the nuclear theories. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they have. They have done these experiments, okay? And what they do is that the proton breaks up. There is, that's the tube where the things, so these are magnets, these are circular magnets and they move their electromagnets, so they move the charge forward very fast through, and so it's pulling the proton. Let's say they're negative magnets, they pull the, the positive proton forward. They keep, and that's how they accelerate it. And that's why it has to be circle, it has to have a perfect circle, all right? And they keep accelerating and accelerating until they get it to maybe about half the speed of light. But they can run it in opposite directions through the same tube. It's, I don't know how they do this. It's amazing. The physics that's involved in this, all right? Uh, particle physics. This is particle physics. This is looking is into. This is, no, no. It, it, uh, it, if, I, if this photo did not have a real human being standing here with a little yellow hat. Something from a movie. Yeah, it's science fiction from, you know, galactic something. And this is done and yeah. So what they get is, I'm just gonna put photo. No, no, the actual, the actual experiment. Uh, let me see if any of these have it. Uh,
Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's amazing. So these are the, yes, these are the kinds of events. It's called an event, all right? And these are the kinds of events that happens when two photons crash against each other within the range of uh, a fraction of the speed of light, okay? And so obviously these are all sub subatomic particles. They're the particles that make up the, the um, proton, and they're called, generally they're called quarks. We're here at the level of the quarks. And the big question now is, is there anything that is making up the quarks or the quarks it, right? And they talk about um, the flavor of the quark and it gets very, very bizarre language. The top quark and the down quark and left and right quarks and one of them, the muons. See, 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 totally, totally. Uh, one is, you ever heard about the Higgs particle, H-I-G-G-S? No. The Higgs particle was discovered a few years ago, finally, at CERN, which is the place that I visited in Switzerland. CERN is the uh, Center d'Energie, the Recherche Nucléaire, whatever in, in French. And uh, they call it the God particle, because the Higgs particle has been... So theoretical physics moves ahead of experimental physics. Theoretical physics is all computer um, math, mathematical formulas. Mm -hmm. They say this should happen. Or this should be there, like the black hole. It's an indirect measurement. Someday we may be able to see the dot. <laughs> okay, And so eventually, years later, applied physics cast a shot. They are. They're absolutely hypothesizing. And then the experimentalists have to fix out their mess, you know, right. figure out how to right. prove right. the theory. The, is this going to work? And if not, where's the error? Exactly. So this guy Higgs uh, had uh, hypothesized this particle, you know, that was missing in the constellation of uh, quarks. There was one particle there was missing because the math didn't add up. To the manina. Amazing. Yes, yes. Yes, they are. So much so that. Yeah, no, y yo me cuando CERN, cuando eh, estaban diseñando este CERN, ok, en, en Switzerland y Francia, hubieron quejas de los pueblos circundantes, porque esta cosa es, well, this is the website. Uh, that's just one of the computer rooms above ground, because all this is underneath. Mm -hmm. Las ciudades de alrededor, los vecinos se quejaron because they said, you're building a machine that is going to generate a black hole. Underneath, this thing is buried like one mile or something like that under the earth to, to be stable. Yeah, because any little tiny movement will ruin the experiment. You know, you got to match up protons. <laughs> <That's so laughs> it's, scary, like, it, it's incredibly it. scary. You know, it says, you're going to generate a black hole here underneath our soil. It says, relax, relax. Uh, we don't think it's going to happen. You know, the chance. <laughs> yeah, we don't say because you can never get an absolute zero from, right, from, right. Uh, from a statistician. This is all probability. But the chances are of getting a black hole from this is like 10 to the minus 43. <laughs> In other words, 
it's, it's more likely that the earth will explode today than to get that, you know, or that will crash into the sun. In fact, that's where you get into probability, which again is very, very esoteric. But bueno, uh, and you see these, the, the very first diagram, you see these wiggles here, these uh, chirulos que están aquí dando vuelta. This is what's representing that atomic event, all right? But in reverse, in other words, instead of being a fusion, it's a fission, all right? It's a splitting. Entonces, ¿qué pasa? We, from those quarks, eventually the subatomic particles, oh yes, because imagine the heat of the Big Bang, right? Of singularity. All of the heat of the universe was starting there. So that had to increase beyond, we talk about red hot, then we talk about white hot, and it's beyond white hot, all right? And so as the universe expands, what happens to heat? Heat dissipates mm -hmm. and it gets cooler mm -hmm. and cooler and cooler. So in the cooling, the cooling is a condensation event. If we take water vapor, which is hot, and we condense it, we get liquid water. And we keep cooling that liquid water, we get ice. And so it's condensing, right? And so as the universe is expanding, it's also cooling. As it's cooling, more matter is condensing and condensing until eventually this somatopic particles begin to collide and form atoms. And it's the atom that is a stable unit of matter. We call it stable because the subatomic particles are not stable, okay? So the atom is the stable. We have to put an adjective to it. So the atom is a stable unit of matter, but we know that the atom can be split into particles. And even the other particle can be split into quarks. But particles and quarks are not stable. They fly around. We cannot hold them. And in fact, and I'll finish with this, I promise. This event, no. Uh, what they call the event, all these photographs and all these uh, chirulos here that are doing, uh, these are cameras. Of course, they're they're not regular camera with film. They're magnetic cameras and uh, electron cameras and whatever. They measure, they take 50 million photos of the event because the event lasts a fraction of a second. And so they take 50 million photos. And when they, and they get such a, a such a humongous amount of information from there that they form it out to uh, nuclear physicists throughout the world, to hundreds of physicists. Whenever they have an event like this, they farm out this information to this um, um, uh, nuclear physicists to work on this right. part. So right. one nuclear right. physics will get exactly. one little thing, exactly, and you analyze that, what that means in contrast to the rest of it. You know, some are going straight, some are curling around, what's going on? And they found it out. Yes. And the way they form it out is through the internet. And so they invented the internet in the 1970s. Okay. CERN, the, 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 the one that's in, yeah, CERN, C-E-R-N, C-E-R-N, <clears throat> right underneath between Switzerland and France. And first they had the intranet. In other words, they had all their computers inside interconnected and that's the intranet. I say, okay, great. So now we're all connected in here, but we have to be in this one building or one complex. Yeah. Now we have to get out to the rest of the world. So we need an internet. And they invented the internet and they decided at that time, these guys decided this is gonna be for free. In other words, the internet is public domain. It belongs to the world. It belongs to the people of the world. Also because they're funded by the EU, which is public money. So everything they do has to be just like here, NSF and NIH, they have right. to publish everything. Right. NASA, it's all publishable because it's our money. And so we have the internet thanks to these people. <laughs> okay, paro ahí, mira, let's do this. Para resumen, just do this part of the summary of today's class, that's enough. I mean, I'm gonna look through. And do. Yeah. There's so much, there's a lot there, and that's exactly what I want you to do because at this point you see also 
you're a graduate student and you're a graduate student on your final leg toward graduation. So you should be able to do the research that that uh, is exciting to you. You know, and that's interesting. All I know is that some of these look like jellyfish, but most of them look like neurons and dendrites. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Like and that's analogous language, you know. So who knows, maybe those circuitries are also inspired. So we say that we see sometimes at the macro level, what is occurring at the micro level. Right but it's reproducing because it just scales orders of magnitude. Mm -hmm. or, uh, yeah, scales. Okay, I think I just do this summary and then I'll send you the rest of the video of this lecture. Okay. And we'll go from there and you'll be looking at videos, you'll be doing your own research, whatever so interests you. So I don't see you then until... Right, we're gonna meet then, the next one is gonna be the first, the, the first. first Saturday, no, it's going to be the first Friday of uh, February. Because it's Saturday. Saturday. Today right. is the 13th. Okay, February meet him. 3rd. Correct. Correct. Because today is the 13th. Next Saturday, I'm committed. Right. And you're committed right. after that. Right. So that's the end so of. So you're going to send me those lectures. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'll be sending you during this week. We got time. You actually, time. We have the whole semester, but I'll be sending you stuff so you can look it up and be looking at it at your own pace, all right? I'll start sending you videos. You can look at it at your own pace. And it's basically, it's just for your enrichment. You've paid for the course already, so I need to deliver the knowledge. <laughs> I need to deliver the material, all right? Okay. Oh, you're welcome. No, my apologies, because I have actually run out. Let me just uh, shut this down and close the video.